Hey listeners, did you know that Consider Before Consuming is a podcast by Fight the New Drug? Fight the New Drug is a non-religious, non-legislative, 501c3 nonprofit that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on the harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. Fight the New Drug is research-based, education-focused, sex-positive, and anti-shame. To learn more about Fight the New Drug and to see the additional free resources that we offer, like our three-part documentary series and our interactive conversation guide, visit ftnd.org. That's ftnd.org. My name is Garrett Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. We want these conversations to be educational, uplifting, and hopeful. As we sit down with experts, influencers, activists, and people with personal accounts, we cover a wide variety of topics that may be triggering to some. You can refer to the episode notes for a specific trigger warning. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode is with Nicholas Kristoff. He's an American journalist, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, and columnist at the New York Times since 2001. His opinion piece published in December 2020, titled The Children of Pornhub Rattled the World, when it gave visibility to the victims of image-based sexual abuse and child sexual abuse materials that are shared on porn sites and social media platforms. During this conversation, we discussed why he decided to write a piece on this topic, changes that Pornhub has made since his piece, how victims and survivors helped bring about these changes, and if he plans on writing a follow-up piece. With that being said, let's jump into the conversation. We hope you enjoy this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Hello. Hi, let me just turn my volume up. Hi, how are you doing? Doing great. How are you? Good, really good. Good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. Okay, how does that, uh, how is that sound? Sounds good on my end. Sounds really good. Good, good. You just got the little lapel mic there. Looks yep. like you're a professional. Looks like you've done <laughs> this before. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Where are you geographically? Uh, New York, just outside New York, but heading back to Oregon, uh, probably in the uh, next week or so, uh, where I'm from. Yeah. I lived a year in Oregon. Oh, where'd you so, live? In Portland. Okay. Yeah. I was really young. So my family moved there. I don't remember it much, but we go on a road trip almost every other year and we include the Oregon coast in that road trip. Isn't that coast just beautiful? Yeah. Yeah. It really is. You were born and raised there, right? Yep. 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 Yeah. How much time do you spend in New York versus Oregon? Um, I mean, traditionally it's been more time in New York, but the last few years, because of the most recent book we did and because, well, because my mom is getting older and she's there. So it's getting closer to, you know, to half, half or, yeah. you know, 40% here, 40% there and another 20% somewhere else. Right. Well, speaking of which, because one of the things that I was amazed by as I learned more about you was all of the different places that you have lived and r sure. correct me if I'm wrong, but you've lived on four continents and, and you've traveled to over 150 countries. Is that right? That's right. Wow. So right. is that part of your journalism? Um, my dad was a World War II refugee. And so, you know, he was very international. Uh, he spoke many languages and so I, <laughs> I inherited that, that wanderlust, you might say, but, yeah. um, but then it also came about just as a reporter, I was based abroad for the New York times for, oh, 15, 16 years. And, um, I, you know, I came to believe that it's really important not just to <laughs> talk to a few experts in Washington, but to actually go out and talk to local people and get out of the Capitol. And it's very much a kind of reporting I like to do. Right. And you're the winner of two Pulitzer Prizes. That's correct. And do you think that that travel and that investigative spirit that you have, do you think that that helped in winning those? I suppose so. Um, I mean, one of them was when I was based in China and so that was, you know, clearly a function of speaking Chinese, getting out, talking to people. 
And the other uh, was mostly for Darfur. And there again, it was a matter of going to a really remote place and trying to piece together a genocide that had been just, you know, astonishingly brutal, but because it wasn't a very remote place, wasn't getting attention. Yeah. Well, we are, uh, we're grateful to have you. You're a co- an accomplished person. You've accomplished so much in your life. Um, just to name a few, you studied law at Harvard? Uh, uh, no, at Oxford. At Oxford. Okay. Yeah. And you've, like I mentioned, traveled, you've lived on four continents, you've been a columnist for the New York Times since 2001. Um, What's something that you're proud of that we haven't talked about yet? Well, I mean, I have raised, I think, three amazing kids. And, uh, you know, we've traveled a lot together. Uh, They've done some really good things. And I think I've, um, I think I've helped in my journalism career, put some issues on the map that maybe wouldn't have got attention otherwise, the Darfur genocide for one. Um, I think I, uh, there are some, some, you know, women's health issues like obstetric fistula that I think got more attention. Um, Human trafficking, I think I got a little more attention to. Um, And um, so, I mean, that's all, you know, that's all encouraging. Right. Well, we uh, admire your work, and the reason why you're with us today is the name of our podcast is Consider Before Consuming, and we put forth information um, that people should consider before consuming pornography. And so I want to start off, you kind of already mentioned the awareness that you've brought to sex trafficking, but I wanted to better understand how you first became aware of or interested in um, image-based abuse on porn sites. So it... um... I mean, it really flowed out of my work on sex trafficking. And, you know, that went back to one trip that I made in, it was 1996 or 1997, I, I forget. And I was based in Tokyo. I made a trip to the Philippines and Cambodia to look at uh, uh, trafficking of children. And uh, particularly in Cambodia, I just could not believe what I was seeing, Garrett. I mean, there were, um, I went to a place where young girls were being auctioned off for their virginity. Um, I went to a brothel where there was a 15 year old girl who'd been, and a 14 year old girl who were, who'd been kidnapped and were, were imprisoned in that brothel. Uh, And they were going to be there until they died of AIDS. And I just could not believe this was, was happening. It was like slavery. Um, And so then I began reporting about that from other places, uh, including in the U S and I was very distressed to see to the degree to which this was a problem in the U.S. as well. Um, not of the magnitude that it was in some Asian countries, but I thought we didn't have the moral right to tell other countries to clean up their act unless we made greater effort to do so at home. And so then um, I had written occasionally about uh, child sexual abuse imagery in this country. And I thought there was this misperception. I mean, I think a lot of Americans think that this involves, you know, some, you know, some 15 year old girl who pulls off her shirt or something. And in fact, you know, as you know, it's often about, you know, prepubescent kids who are being raped in every which way and, um, and with impunity. Um, And uh, so then last summer, I, I, I sort of been following the Pornhub. I was aware of it, but I wasn't, didn't really know what to think of it. And then um, asked some people, then went online. And some of the first images that I saw were of uh, unconscious women who were uh, being stripped and raped. And the rapists, to prove that they were unconscious, were uh, touching their eyeballs uh, to show that these women were um, you know, drugged out, drunk, I don't know what it was. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I just, it, you, you know, you look at this unconscious woman being raped in a company, a major internet company is monetizing that. Uh, and you think about what that does to those women when they find out that this rape, I mean, they're not only brutalized for half an hour or somewhere, they're brutalized for the rest of their lives for all to see. And um, so, for me, at least, it's, you know, it's one thing to have this debate at 30,000 feet about 
about uh, rights and how and regulation. And then when you actually see those images, that was that was you know really pretty horrifying, and that took me up. And that's when I decided I want to write about this. And since your piece on on Pornhub, um, that happened in December of 2020, so really recently. Um, can you talk to some of the changes that have been made um, that Pornhub has made since December of 2020? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, <laughs> I should clarify that it wasn't that Pornhub read my piece and said, oh, boy, Nick, you really wrote it very effectively. We're convinced. Well, <laughs> you know, basically what happened was uh, the credit card companies then, then said, OK, we're going to investigate. And then very promptly they said, OK, there's illegal content on Pornhub and we will therefore uh, not process uh credit card payments uh, for the company, um, uh, at least for in terms of um, direct services. I, I think that they will still accept credit card payments for ads. But uh, and that uh, that really I mean, that shook up Pornhub in a way that my writing did not. And so as a result, Pornhub um, uh, stopped uh, the downloading of videos. And most important, they um, took off all the, um, the, the unverified images on their website, and, which is about 10 million images, so about two thirds of their, of their images and videos. And um, so that was a, you know, that was a huge, a huge transformation. I got a note from one young woman who'd had uh, a naked video of herself on on Pornhub for the last year, she'd been unable to get it down. And she said that, uh, and it was taken down uh, now. And she said, you know, I can breathe again. That's, that's very cool. Yeah, that's neat. Speaking to those changes that Pornhub has made since, since December of 2020, are you proud of the changes that have been made? Yeah, I, I'd say I am. I mean, we, I think that in journalism, so I'm a columnist and, you know, so I'm in the opinion business, but I actually think that our impact is less in terms of changing people's minds on things that they've thought about. So if I write about Donald Trump, if I write about the Middle East, if I write about abortion, I don't actually change people's minds. They tend, you know, they've already had positions. Um, yeah. But where I think we do have a, a real impact is our ability to shine our light on an issue that people are not paying attention to, thereby project it onto the agenda, make people spill their coffee in the morning as they read the paper, and, you know, force difficult conversations about subjects that are hard to talk about. And I think this kind of child sexual abuse imagery is one of them. I think a lot of Canadians in particular were unaware that they were host to a company that had that kind of imagery uh, online and, uh, you know, that Canada was in effect inflicting uh, rape videos on the world. And I, you know, I think Canadians were embarrassed by that, ashamed of that, and they've been uh, taking action. Um, but, you know, I've got to say that Pornhub is one company among a number, and it becomes really important that one doesn't just stop with Pornhub because then immediately the business just flows to to other rival companies, and uh, you you haven't really made a a, a difference. Uh, so you've got to it, it's it, one has to go after the the sector and not just one individual company, right? You talked about uh, one survivor that reached out to you and said how your article was the spark to getting that removed. Um, what can you talk to the role that survivors played in bringing about these changes? They were they were absolutely critical because you know it's those stories that move people. Um, as I said, if you have a debate at thirty thousand feet about regulation about porn, then people have all kinds of different views. When you hear about a 14 year old girl who's, you know, who has attempted suicide repeatedly because of um, naked videos that were put on Pornhub that, you know, I mean, destroyed her life is a little bit strong, but, it, you know, were truly devastating. Uh, and as a company, 
made money off her, um, then I think that anybody is going to um, feel differently and feel sympathetic and feel that there is an injustice here that needs to be remedied. And so I think it's really important to give a voice to those survivors and, and explain what, you know, what this means in real life. And uh, so um, they, you know, and I must say it was, it was hard to get survivors to tell these stories, especially with their names attached. And um, one of the challenges in journalism, as you know, is that if we just write about a, you know, a 14 year old girl somewhere, then it doesn't have the verisimilitude, it doesn't have the power of being able to give her name and hometown and show her picture and have her talking about it. And it's, it's, that, uh, it's that reality that moves people, but you also worry about the effect on her. Um, you, and you know, these people have been through so much already and they're humiliated, they're stigmatized, then to ask them to step up and relate all this to go over the most humiliating period of their lives uh, is asking a lot of them. And, um, you know, they were fantastic to cooperate. Right. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about Canada and um, that's because Pornhub is, is headquartered in Canada. Is that why you mentioned Canada? That's correct. Yeah. Um, can you talk to the parenting company of Pornhub, MindGeek, um, based on the changes that have been made, um, what do you anticipate will happen with MindGeek in the long run? So I think that MindGeek is probably going to pay a significant price for the um, its abuses in the past in terms of uh, civil liability and criminal liability. I, you know, I don't know, but I, I think... Uh, you know, it may well face criminal liability for some of these uh, videos that were on the site. And I think it very likely will as well um, in uh, lawsuits in Canada and the U.S. Um, and so uh, I think that's a real shadow over uh, the company's uh, financial future. Um, I, um, I think that, I mean, my sense of the business model is very hard to get them or anybody to talk about the business model of it. But I think that they actually had a business model that uh, would have been uh, that, you know, if they'd been willing to earn 20% less money um, that they could have done it without having that, that liability. And they in the long run would have been much more, you know, they would have saved themselves a ton of money and save themselves their jobs and maybe their company. And I think they risked it all by going too far, by not having enough moderators, by telling, letting the moderators approve things that should never have been approved. Um, but you know, that's the, uh, that's <laughs> when companies are on edge um, too often they do that. All right. In your article, you uh, told the story about a victim who, in the aftermath of her abuse, became homeless. And um, since your article, because of your article, a GoFundMe was started, and now that person is off the streets and hoping to start vet school. Yeah. Um, can you talk to that experience a little bit more? Yeah, her name is uh, Serena Flightis, and she's um, and you know it's a tribute to Serena that she was willing to to use her name and. Um, you know, that, that has so much power. It's very evocative. Uh, she's 19 now when she was in the eighth grade. Uh, she, she was a very, very sheltered kid, you know, had never made out with a boy. And then in eighth grade, she has a crush on a ninth grader. Um, he asks her for a naked photo. She's really flattered. She doesn't really know anything about the internet. She sends him a photo you know, he asked for another, he asked for some videos, she sends them. Then, you know, he shows them to some other kids, they, they're passed around, then they end up on Pornhub. And uh, her, I mean, her, her just her life just just collapses. And then boys are telling her that, okay, send me a naked video too, or I'm going to send these to your parents. Uh, she is humiliated to go to school. Her mom drops her off at the front school gate 
she goes through, walks out the side gate and just skips school. Um, she transfers to a new school, but there are some kids from the old school who are at the new school and word immediately goes around and she ends up um, uh, dropping out of school. She ends up self-medicating uh, with um, meth and heroin. Um, she attempts suicide. Uh, and, you know, this is, <laughs> this is an A student and things are going fine. And then she does this really dumb thing. And, but every 14 year old kid in human history has done really dumb things and right. we recover. You have, I have, but those dumb things we did at 14 don't haunt us the way, uh, and they, in this case, it, you know, it, Serena did something really stupid and then porn hub did something to monetize that stupidity in ways that hugely inflamed the situation. And, um, so you know, if, if she had just sent that video to that boy and he showed it to some others, yeah, that would have, I mean, that would have been a real hassle for her. Um, but she would have recovered. And instead, uh, she, when I talked to her, she was homeless, living in a car with three dogs. And the dogs were the only creatures that were forgiving, that loved her unconditionally. And, um, and uh, then... And she, you know, and, and Serena told her story with, uh, you know, humility. She acknowledged that she'd done really dumb stuff. And she just wanted to warn other kids about um, how you do something stupid like that and that you don't get another chance. And um, so um, uh, and we took a, we, we sent a photographer to spend a day with her. Um, then the uh, photos ran with the story and I think readers were really moved. Um, and they, um, you know, they stepped up, they, we got <laughs> plenty of readers offering her, uh, housing of one kind or another. Uh, a couple of different vets offered her jobs in their, in their, in their veterinary offices. Uh, people, um, um, were offering her money to go to, she wanted, she wanted to go to, uh, to be a school, to be a vet tech. They were offering her help with that. And one, uh, billionaire stepped up and offered her, you know, to, to pay her tuition. And so that's all, that's all unfolding right now. And, that's uh, so, cool. so it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very reassuring and it's great to see readers step up. It's great to see the impact on Serena, but that is not a scalable model of how to help victims of porn hub. Right. Have you had more victims reach out about their experiences with Pornhub since the I article? Have. Yeah, I have. Um, and, you know, that's, that's wonderful and moving. Uh, you know, this one girl who said that uh, when this naked video was taken down of her, uh, that she can breathe again. And, you know, that, that's, that's, that's great. Um, but, uh, but then again, I heard of a, a girl who at 16 had had a video put up on the site and um, her life went downhill as it did for Serena and she attempted suicide, but unlike Serena, she succeeded. And so uh, she is now gone. Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, there's, there was a lot of devastation uh, that has unfolded because of this. Right. Yeah, that's a very true statement. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the, the pushback that you've received as a journalist in general and specifically reporting on this issue. Sure. I mean, so some of the pushback is, um, um, I say it comes in two kinds. It's, you know, so one element of it is harassment, uh, some uh, death threats, some people, uh, apparently there's a Reddit, uh, uh, there's a subreddit that has gone after me particularly. And so, um, so people on that subreddit have been uh, just kind of descending on me. Um, uh, and, you know, but that's, I'm, I dish it out. 
I can take it. I kind of think that if somebody tweets a death threat at you, it's probably not to be taken terribly seriously. And uh, so um, I'm, uh, uh, you know, but that's kind of one category. And then the other is, I'd say a more um, kind of intellectual kind, which is, is, is criticism. Look, I, I'm socially liberal and I uh, quoted, uh, uh, Exodus Cry and uh, Lila Micklewaite, who's been very, very active on this issue. And so there's a line of critique that, uh, look, you're working with, um, uh, you know, people who have a homophobic, uh, um, extreme right wing point of view in ways that actually hugely disadvantage very marginalized sex workers. And, um, and, and then there, you know, so you must be, you must be ultra right wing yourself and so on. And, and um, um, you know, my, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that I disagree with Lila and with Exodus Cry on all kinds of issues. I, I, I don't think there's a basis for saying that they're homophobic, uh, whatever, but I, uh, I'm sure I disagree profoundly with them. I also think it's really important for liberals and conservatives to actually make common cause on some of these issues. And um, in the area of human trafficking, um, we have a Trafficking Victims Protection Act because bleeding heart feminists were willing to work with bleeding heart evangelicals to pass a uh, a major bill at the end of the Clinton administration that right. then the Bush administration implemented uh, aggressively. And, uh, you know, likewise, uh, AIDS is a cause, you know, near and dear to my heart that I reported on an awful lot. And that involved a lot of, um, um, again, you know, bleeding heart international health activists with bleeding heart evangelicals in the Bush administration that, uh, has resulted in the PEPFAR program, which has saved 20 million lives so far. And so I'm, um, <laughs> I'm actually a great believer in trying to bridge some of the faith gaps, some of the left-right gaps and finding uh, common cause. And if we can find common cause and go after a company that is monetizing the rape of children, uh, then uh, that's, you know, that's great. And I'm, you know, I, I think I disagree probably with you, probably with a number of other people about in that I'm not uh, intrinsic. I don't, I'm not going to really have a view about porn itself, but to me, this is not an issue of, of being against porn. This is an issue of being against, you know, child rape. And, uh, but again, if we can, we don't have to agree on everything. We can, if we can find a common denominator in agreeing that, you know, 14, imagery of 14 year old girls shouldn't be on a site, then let's, let's, let's agree on that. Let's go after that. So I find, I see no shame in working with people who uh, disagree with me. And in fact, I think that's how you get things done. Right. Um, and um, the, no, there, there is, there has been a critique as well that, um, uh, that some uh, people uh, in Model Hub, some some adult performers have lost their incomes because of uh, Visa and MasterCard cutting off payments. Um, I think that that is somewhat overstated because uh, the credit card companies are still um, allowing paying for ad, allowing their cards to be used for ads on their sites, and that is a significant part of the revenue for people on. Uh, model hub. And then there are also plenty of other uh, sites that they can perform on. Um, and, um, you know, at the end of the day, you look at trade-offs and it's, you know, it's, I'm sure that when Harvey Weinstein was arrested, people and his business full of people lost their jobs and that's too bad. And that's unfortunate, but it was still worth it to have Harvey Weinstein arrested. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, if there are some marginalized folks out there who lose some income on Model Hub. I think that's uh, unfortunate, but I also think of people who no longer have um, 
videos themselves as underage kids uh, on Pornhub and who can breathe again. And uh, that's a trade off I'm willing to make. Right. Well, what's next for you um, in regards to this topic specifically? Is it something you've developed a long term interest in? Um, will you write another piece, a follow up piece at some point? No, we'll, we'll, we'll see. As I said, I'd written, uh, you know, a, about it to some degree before, and I suspect I, uh, I will again. I'm interested in um, X videos in particular because X videos or the, you know, that holding company, that empire um, is arguably even bigger in terms of traffic than uh, the Pornhub slash MindGeek empire. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's red lines seem to be even fewer on, um, on X videos. I noticed when I was poking around that if you search uh, middle school, then it, among its suggestions, it offered elementary school. You know, I mean that, you know, how can a, one of the top 10 websites in the world offer you elementary school kids? Uh, so they, I noticed that after I wrote that, they did take out that suggestion, um, you know, but um, I, I do think that it's really important that uh, we don't go after just a company, but a sector or otherwise, you know, then the, then the problems just bounce to some other company. Um, and uh, so, um, so I may well come back and, and look at uh, X videos uh, and that empire and, uh, and, you know, probably tell it in much the same way with stories of victims and the human cost. Right. Well, uh, Nick, we appreciate your time today. Um, we know your time, you know, we know you're a busy individual, so we appreciate you joining us today. Absolutely. And I appreciate, you know, your uh, listeners interest and activism on an issue that I think is a really important human rights topic and um, one that isn't talked enough about. And, you know, for that, I salute you, Garrett, because I, as a journalist, I've come to conclude that we make the worst policy as a country about issues that are that are hard to talk about. And that's, you know, it's mental health, it's domestic violence, it's anything to do with sex, it's drugs. And uh, we have to just break those taboos and have conversations, maybe difficult, awkward conversations. And then that lays a basis for an understanding, which lays a basis for better policy. So hats off to you and uh, keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you very much. In regards to how or I guess in regards to us tagging you on social media and things or our audience reaching out to you, are you yeah. comfortable with that? Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. Well, we will make sure to link your social media accounts to this episode and sure. um, so that our audience can reach out and show you some love and support as well. So absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And take care. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Looking for a way to spread awareness on the harms of porn? Why not rep the movement in one of our conversation starting tees? With over 20 tees and various designs and phrases, you're bound to find something that speaks to you and will spark conversations with others. Plus, because we're a 501c3 nonprofit, there's no taxes on your purchase and the proceeds help to mobilize this movement. Get your gear today at ftnd.org forward slash shop. That's ftnd.org forward slash S-H-O-P. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science facts and personal accounts. If you want to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. Again, big thanks to you for listening to this conversation. As you go about your day, we invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.